Hi, Randy. <laughs> it's so lovely to have you on here. Thank you so much for agreeing to interview with us. Um, it's amazing to have you. I'm Victory. I'm a first year undergrad at MIT. Whoa. And do you mind telling us a bit about yourself, your background, your interests, anything you think is relevant before we formally kick into questions? Yeah, definitely. Um, thanks for having me. Excited to be interviewed. Uh, so my name is Randy Williams. I am a fourth year PhD student. I am in the media lab and I work in the personal robots group. My research is mostly about, uh, well, my one liner is I build socially intelligent robots to teach kids about artificial intelligence. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, that's like a quick version of what I do. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's amazing that we have this woman in AI group. I'm so excited to um, yeah, be a part of it. Welcome to all the women. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. I love the representation. I was also saying that Randy is our first woman of color interviewee, which is kind of exciting. So yeah, we'd love to see it. Um, so my first question for you actually is kind of about your background. I love the one-liner you gave us, but before we like kick into your AI career, I did a, back a bit of background research on you, kind of stalked you, don't mind me. Um, but I did see that you studied computer engineering at the um, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and then you kind of came to MIT and did meter arts and sciences. So I was wondering, yeah. like, where did the shift come in? Like, what inspired that switch? What was your eureka moment? Why did you become a media arts and science, AI education focused kind of person. How did that happen? Yeah, um, it was a series of unexpected events, honestly. <laughs> um, so even like choosing UMBC, um, I actually my dream school was MIT and I got in for undergrad. I was like, oh, it's so cool, I'd love to be here. Um, and I think what I didn't realize was how much it would cost to go to MIT and like Ooh. they sent the bill and I was like, oh no, um, and, uh, UMBC. The school in Maryland, I'm from Maryland, born and raised, um, they actually have a scholarship program, money, um, and in particular, they have a scholarship program, it's called Meyerhoff Scholars, and it's about having more African Americans get STEM PhDs. So A, they like, you know, support you through undergraduate, but they also prepare you to go and get a PhD after you're done. And so I have like a whole bunch of friends from undergrad who are now also in PhD programs. Um, that was incredible for a bunch of reasons. A, I didn't know what a PhD was, but I was like, all right, I mean, I got money. <laughs> you, know, like, you can do it. Like, you go be a problem. Like, I don't even know what that means, but you know, you guys seem pretty into it. So, yeah. Um, but, sort of like as a part of that, um, one of the things they do is like every summer they're like, go and do research. Cause, you know, that's how you, you know, that's what a PhD is about. Um, so, in order to prepare for that, prepare for that, they're like, go and do research. And I did a research experience at MIT like after my junior year. So right before, yeah, right before I graduated. Um, and I was like such an engineer. I was like, I'm gonna be an engineer forever. I'm gonna build stuff. I went engineering schools and at MIT, they were like, so you got placed in the media lab. And I'm like, what is that? How do I do media? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, but I didn't have a choice. Um, and then I went and fell in love with it so hard. So like, what's oh hard? Media Lab, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful story. Um, Media Lab is a place where like scientists, designers, um, like artists and technologists all sort of like come together. And I realized that a lot of the questions that I had about life in the world um, were actually the intersections of a bunch of those things. So now I do research where I think about people, I think about how people learn, I think about um, how people interact with technology but my computer engineering degree only really gave me the tools to like do the technology as opposed to like, you know, consider like how art and um, psychology and like all these other things played in. So I went there for the summer, loved it. And, you know, history <laughs> yeah. from there. Here I am as a PhD student. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. That's kind of crazy though. Like MIT basically forced you into what you're doing now. And you found out like, I feel like that was like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. maybe it was predestined and like it's, it's awesome that you're there now and kind of just like um, piggybacking off of your point on um, human centered interaction, like computers interacting with humans and the intersects with engineering and psychology and arts and sciences. Um, would you say that like being an engineer or being a scientist is it's super essential to also have a humanities background or a social science background or um, being able to overlap both things strengthens you in the field in AI specifically, like, would you say that is the case and why? 
I mean, I'm certainly biased, but yeah, yeah. The problems that we're like trying to deal with today are oftentimes at the intersection. So I think, you know, if you're a humanities person, certainly like dig into the technical stuff and see how your perspective and your like expertise can definitely lead to more insight and like technical things. And if you're a technical person, yeah, totally broaden your scopes um, because in order to like a bunch of AI problems are applied, you know, certainly there are people working on theory and just like getting the algorithms to uh, be even better. But a lot of times we're trying to apply these technical ideas to these, like any field that you can imagine, like healthcare or education right. in my case, yeah, um, all kinds of things. And so in order to do that well, you certainly need to take time to understand those fields and to like respect mm -hmm. the like knowledge that comes from those fields. It certainly has helped me quite a bit. Awesome. Love to hear. I think that's a common misconception, especially for me before getting here. You know, I just kind of thought, you know, science, engineering, MIT, engineering school. And then I started taking a philosophy class and realized like there were intersects with technology and philosophy. I was like, wow, blown away. Um, wow. Okay, so kind of shifting, getting more towards the work that you do now. So your work centers around um, AI education, accessibility to young students. Wait, do you mind yeah. restating your one liner? It was kind of cool. I build socially intelligent robots to teach kids about artificial intelligence. Socially intelligent <laughs> robots to teach kids about artificial intelligence. Love it. Um, and I know you also do work in accessibility. So you want CS education to be more um, available to not just young people, but people who normally don't have access to it. Um, is that something that you... I mean, I, I empathize with that deeply, specifically when I was reading about you. I empathize with that because I come from Nigeria. Um, I grew up there. I just moved to the U.S. this year. So I, I know what it's like to not have CS education and to be around people who don't. Um, would you say that's like something that has motivated you? Would you say that's something you experienced or you know people who've experienced and it's kind of like one thing that you um, you you do like it kind of inspired you to do what you do now. And if it is something that you went through growing up, how did you overcome that? Um, how did you get access to opportunities that led you to where you are now? Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, and it's funny because I guess like now I know better. So especially when I say accessibility, um, it's like there's certainly like a ton of accessibility work around like disability and things like that. and. I'm like adjacent to that space, but I'm not really in that no. space. Yeah, yeah. Exactly like you described, I wanna make um, technology accessible, not only like accessible, but I want people to know that they have the power to create and reimagine and like do all the things with technology um, that other people have, um, regardless of what background they come from. Um, so for me, I grew up in a place called Prince George's County, Maryland. You don't know anything about it, it's the best, but um, it's also a predominantly African-American county, um, which is very, very different than like MIT where like people from everywhere, like there, you know, pretty much everyone was black. And that was super normal. Um, my mom did a really great job. She also did engineering um, in college and sort of stumbled into it because someone offered her a scholarship too. And she's oh. like, oh, <laughs> we're there. Um, she did a great job of like having me and my sisters like do a bunch of like engineering stuff growing up. Um, and it wasn't really until I like left that space, left high school and went to college. I was like, oh wait, like I was really lucky to have those opportunities and a lot of people don't. Right. Um, and honestly, I was looking at some stuff that like people who like were coming in MIT with me had done. And I was like, why are you building rockets at 17? <laughs> like, oh How do you have access to any of that? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think like that definitely birthed the passion in me to say, well, I think, you know, the opportunity to be creative with tech or like whatever um, isn't, you know, given to everyone, but the possibility, the talent, the creativity, like certainly everyone has that. So how do we like sort of deal with the sort of gap between those two things? How do we make sure that people who may not have money, may not have like mentors, may not have like a mom who's an engineer who's like forcing you to go to all these things over the weekend, how do we make sure that they also know that there's a space for them here? Um, and so, yeah, that very much has to do with how I build things and why. Um, so I get to work in schools a lot, which is super fun because mm -hmm. not only do I get to like hang out in the lab, but I get to see it in the real world. And I like specifically target the schools that are like, we want to do CS, but we don't have a CS teacher. We ain't got no money. And like, you know, right. we're yeah. Love that. Ground zero. And I'm like, great. I want you to be the school that starts this whole AI thing. Because it's kind of new. You know, if you come into 
any school and you're like, are you teaching AI? They're probably gonna say no. Um, but yeah, what does it mean for like the schools who have the least to like have this huge like leg up? How do we like make sure like all the funding that, you know, MIT has access to is then given to people who, um, you know, typically wouldn't have access. I think that's a really hard problem to solve, but like a really important problem to solve, especially if we wanna do things like, you know, use AI, you always say like for social good, um, but like the for social good question is always like, okay, but who's defining that good? And like, whose problems are we solving? And are we solving them for them? Or are we like inviting people to participate in this space? Like, I think if we're gonna do a better job with that, then education is a place to start. Well, right. But yeah, it's like definitely yeah. one that we <laughs> I mean, you said so many things I resonate with right now. I have like a bunch of things to say. I mean, like, first of all, with like the building rockets at 17, I, I totally relate with that. Cause like coming here, I have like imposter syndrome has hit me so hard. And I realized like there are just many opportunities that people have here that we didn't have back in Nigeria or that people in Maryland didn't also have. And it's like amazing to see that you're bridging that gap and working to bridge that gap and using computer science and artificial intelligence to bridge that gap. Um, And I kind of love how you talk about, you know, directing MIT's funding towards that, taking MIT's money to where it needs to be, you know, and getting the scholarships. Yeah. Um, and you also, your response actually leads back to my next question for you, um, which was about the How to Train Your Robot program um, that you worked on, the curriculum for middle school students. Um, I'm really interested, really curious about how that came about, what goes into developing such a curriculum that fits students, and also why there's an emphasis on ethics. I mean, like, these kids are young, so why are you teaching them about such hot topic discussions in AI? Why do you think it's important to do that? I'm really curious. Yeah. So how to train your robot, it is, it originally was a five day, like all day, all school day, five day curriculum, um, but it's about AI and ethics. It's designed for middle school students. Um, it is mostly like, you don't need anything but like a computer with a browser, like a Chromebook, you know, mm -hmm. super low base line um, to get started. Um, but it actually, the, there's a cute little robot. There's I just have lying around here. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's I don't know this the robot cost thirty dollars and I worked really hard to make sure that it was like not it, it can't be like more than fifty and even thirty I was like eh, can we not do better um, yeah. I think it's important people have like tangible experiences when they're learning about AI because it's not just something that happens on a computer it's something that can be brought into your space with you mm -hmm. but yes yeah, so that's I like think the briefest version of how to train your robot um, and basically students learn to train image text classifiers they learn about AI ethics. Um, they also get to do really cool projects. Um, so how did that come about? Um, all like a ton of credit has to go to my lab mate, or uh, she graduated now, um, Blakely Payne, who built this middle school AI plus ethics curriculum, which was all about, you know, just like making it a lot easier for teachers to have discussions in their classroom about ethics and like the ethics of AI. And it starts from like simple points like algorithms, right? We all think they're math. We all think like, you know, one plus one is always going to be two and they're so objective, but no, that is not true. <laughs> they have a lot to do with who's training them, what they think the right answer should be. And, right. you know, like even when like testing it to say like, oh, did it get the like objective answer right? No, they, they still have an idea of what they think the right answer is. And that mm -hmm. is always going to feed into how they design things. And if we're doing like calculators, one plus one is two. I mean, A, you could be like, well, you know, what base are you using and like all that stuff. But like, if we like get you more complicated than that, when we get to things like image recognition or face recognition algorithms, then yeah. you can really start the impacts of those systems like much more. Um, so we talk about in the curriculum, things like Joy Bolomini's work, where she was like, yeah, these algorithms have 99% accuracy. If you are a pale skinned male appearing person, like right. if you have dark skin, and if you're a woman, like a peering person, then like, yeah, maybe 66% accuracy. And like the gap, like the reason why that gap exists is just because the person designing it didn't think it was a problem. Like that wasn't the problem they were trying to solve. They were like, this just works for everyone, but their idea of everyone was flawed. Yeah. Um, so why do we teach middle schoolers that? Um, two things. A, I think it's super duper important that like as these technologies just come out into the world, like everyone's using like, Snapchat filters and like using YouTube, YouTube recommending the things like these algorithms are everywhere. Yeah, um, I think it's for people to understand like how they work and not just be like, oh, like obviously 
if the if my phone, if my computer, if my Alexa tells me something, it's right. Um, I don't think that's gonna work. <laughs> um, so the idea is called being a conscientious consumer. How do we give people education that they need to be conscientious, just like aware um, of what's going on um, as they use things. Um, the other thing is, I think it's really important for people to grow to be ethical engineers as well. So like reflecting on my engineering undergrad degree, I took like, like one ethics course and I love the teacher, all respect to them, but we talked about like, you know, like the Challenger, like shuttle, like explosion and all the things that went wrong with that. And like, yeah, that's important, but then we'd go back and like, build an operating system or like do some like embedded thing. And the two ideas were just like never connected. And I think that's a huge disservice to engineers. Like if you like are learning all of this math stuff, you're learning how to build stuff, you're learning how to have an impact on the world, but you never learn that like there's nuance there and that like, there's ways for you to not build systems that are like racist and sexist, mm -hmm. then yeah, we're sort of uh, letting people down. Um, and so as I'm teaching these middle schoolers, some of whom have never programmed before, how to train their own algorithms. I'm like, and here are some considerations that you might want to take um, as you're building it, because like there are important ethics questions here, and just like giving them the power and the skills to like be able to like do that well, like upfront, like as they're learning the technical thing, they're also learning the ethical thing. I just think that makes them like better engineers <laughs> in the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very much like kind of a political statement. I'm like raging against how I was taught. I'm like, get <laughs> what's your excuse yeah yeah <laughs> I mean I, I feel like that's kind of fair because I think like when we go through things we don't want other people to go through them and that's like kind of what makes us human like good humans um and I love the term conscientious consumers I haven't heard that before so I just learned something new um and the fact that like you're building up with everything i mean it's it's kind of it's like the thing about a lot of educational systems or like what i've experienced is like you learn something and then you leave out something and then you go to like college and then you realize that there was something left and you have to like fuse those back together and that kind of like messes it up because it's not that easy to to like dismantle everything you've learned and then put something back in but then when you're building it together it makes a lot more sense that was kind of abstract but I know like I'm like a thousand percent like I'm doing this work backwards and I'm like why didn't they just teach me this the first time? yeah exactly <laughs> and that's what you're doing I mean now you're fixing that you're fixing the problem and you're building curriculum that is like important um and also like also an about another project you did so that was more about like the ethics and the education kind of side um I'm also kind of a big fan of your um pop blocks project because I have a seven-year-old yeah. brother I have a seven-year-old okay. brother and he likes scratch and I did not know there was something similar that could teach him about AI and artificial intelligence because like yeah. he knows the term AI but he doesn't really know what it is you know <laughs> like <laughs> so I'm also interested in what what went into like the design thinking process the ideation, yeah. the system design, you know, more like nuances, more specific details about like why you built that project, how building it up came about and um, how you've seen students interact with it that has kind of made you happy or proud of the work <laughs> that you're doing, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I love that question. Um, so uh, Pop Blocks and Pop Bots, that was a project that I did where I, I used a social robot to teach like pre-K and kindergarten children about artificial intelligence. Um, and it used like scratch like blocks. If you've seen scratch like block-based programming, use those, except my kids could not read. So it just had images. And so oh. it was like very interesting to think about, you know, how do you make these ideas accessible to super young kids? Mm -hmm. um, and it started kind of like, you know, your story with your brother. Um, so basically my robot, we're a social robotics group. So we have a bunch of robots. They're super cute. Um, go look at Pega, go look at g -Book. they're just the best. Mm -hmm. um, and we would use them for literacy, so helping um, like younger kids, five-year-olds, like learn how to read. Mm -hmm. And it's because like, you know, in Boston, there's a ton of people who come from uh, like other countries or like just don't speak English at home for whatever reason. We dump all these kids into kindergarten and we're like, all right, we're going to learn our ABCs. And some kids, you know, they're having like story time at night with their mm -hmm. parents every night and then other kids just don't. And it's just like this huge difference in like ability and they all just are in the same classroom like struggling. So the robot helps with that. Um, and what I noticed was like a lot of kids were interacting with the robot in like these really weird ways were like, okay, this is how you talk to the robot. And they're like, I got this. I have an Alexa at home. Hey, Tego, what's the Oh my word? god. Oh my god. 
<laughs> and like it's hilarious but also like that's a huge totally different like relationship with technology than we yeah. have yeah like imagine yeah. like being five and being able to surf the internet just because like you know everything talks to you right <laughs> it's totally different. so I was like curious about that I was like okay so what did these kids think about these technologies um and it's basically what you said they're like yeah they could totally interact with it they could ask all the questions they had no idea how it works mm. they're like is there a little man in a box in Alexa and I'm like no <laughs> <laughs> and then there's like one kid who's like well I have like a black Alexa at home, but this is a white Alexa, so I have to get to know her. And I'm like, how do I explain the cloud to this four year old? Like, how do I like, like this is the same? <laughs> it was a lot. Um, and so I was like, okay, how could we use this technology that already works really well for students, social robots, and make these things more accessible? Um, because the thing is, four year olds, they cannot read. They also don't know that much about math. So I was like, obviously, we're not gonna like, you know, have algorithm, like, right. <laughs> not gonna like, you know, write stuff out on the board with like all the equations and stuff. Um, but humans are very social. And if what my theory was, if you can have an algorithm and have it explain itself socially, then it would be really easy for students to understand. So great example, supervised machine learning um, is when you like, you know, you label stuff and then it uses uh, some process to figure out uh, where to put like a dividing line to classify things. So I had kids do supervised machine learning on foods and what this robot is, the system, whatever robot knew about the foods was like how many calories it was, what color it was, how it was spelled, um, how much sugar it had, stuff like that. Um, so it could do this K nearest neighbors algorithm. Like it knew that like broccoli was more similar to um, corn than like ice cream, stuff like that. So kids would, you know, label a few, they're like broccoli, healthy ice cream, unhealthy. Um, and then ask the system, okay, what do you think about carrots? And the robot would say, okay, carrots. Carrots are a lot like broccoli. So I'm gonna say carrots are also healthy. Um, and you'd be like, cool, well, okay, what do you think about potato chips? And it's like potato chips. Potato chips are kind of like broccoli too. So is that also healthy? And then the kid could like fix it and be like, no, that's unhealthy. And it's like, okay, yeah. thanks for teaching me. Like, let's go on to the next. So same algorithm but rather than like throwing math at the kids just making it like more transparent and then just giving them the freedom to train it exactly how they want so I think my favorite experiences were having those super mischievous kids that were like I'm gonna make this robot think that all the foods that I like are healthy and then they get <laughs> oh, that's so cute <laughs> they're so good and then all the foods I don't like those are unhealthy yeah um, but like what was super dope about that is that we could have conversations like okay how do you think Alexa like knows things like who do you think trained it how do you know that you can trust them and they weren't like you know trying to trick you mm -hmm. and like just watching like a five-year-old go like I can't trust Alexa that much anymore I have to figure out how she was trained oh my gosh that's so cute <laughs> that's so much. I love that yeah <laughs> um so yeah a that was like also an experiment to say can we teach super young people about AI and again the argument being like if we can teach a four-year-old we can teach anyone so people yeah. can stop telling me they're like not computer science people. I'm like, look, I taught a four-year-old. You can learn too. Um, but also like, you know, looking at like how the robot should express itself, how the robot should, you know, just give space to be trained as well as um, like what level of intelligence it needed. Um, those are the kinds of questions I was playing with. It's very much like an engineering project, but also felt like a lot of art and like a lot of design was a part of it as well. And just like back and forth with the students, yeah. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love that. I loved listening to that. Like I would just like re-listen to that entire story again because that was like <laughs> that was amazing. I mean, I could just like imagine the kids like being mischievous and trying to manipulate the yeah. pop box. No, kind of reminds, yeah, and it kind of reminds me of my brother. So I empathize even more with that. And that's like it's it's so cool that you've gotten to to work with like not just middle schoolers with like curriculum development, but also with like pre-K K students. So you've like been around the spectrum. So you kind of know, you know your stuff, you know. Um that's extremely cool um and also you, you kind of brought back ethics into it so the fact that you could tell them about yeah. alexa and not being able to trust alexa and that is also somehow yeah kind of related to ai and ethics which is yeah. it shows how intertwined the two are and how inseparable like ai and the ethical parts of it are um and piggybacking off of what you said again um and mm -hmm. kind of going back to pre-k to 12 
sorry, pre-K to middle school to like students generally um, yeah. who haven't gotten to the stage of like university or anything. Um, it's it's like it's definitely clear and evident that AI education, that computer science education, isn't that as widespread, especially AI education. Um, what do you think we could be doing better? How do you think we could, as a society, um, how do you think we could make that more accessible on a broader scale to less, you know, privileged communities, to communities generally, maybe like starting with Massachusetts? Um, how can schools like MIT drive that change quicker, faster, and in a more effective manner? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly some things I've learned, but like, I would love to know the answer to this question as well. Um, I think one thing that I've learned, so I started with the prop bots and then I moved into sort of like the middle school stuff. Um, and the difference there was when I started with the prop bots and the pre-K teachers, they're like, this was so cool. We love that you did this. Are you gonna come back next year? And I was like, well, you're like no like that's not gonna work because if I'm the only one who can do this then like there's a huge disservice like it's, it's not gonna be able to spread that much um and so in working with the middle school teachers I was like how can I make sure that you feel empowered to do this and honestly they know their students so much better I was just like okay this needs to go out of my hands and toward the teacher so now I do a ton of teacher training um and like that matters like what teachers need what schools need what students need are A, like resources. So creating a curriculum, providing robots, all that stuff um, that needs to be there. Then they need training and like some idea of how to work into their day, how to like have conversations with students, how to build stuff with students. And they need money, like, <laughs> and I can't control that part, um, but I can at least help with the other two. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you have like access to money then stuff like that could really make a huge difference in a school. But some stuff I'm trying to still figure out are like, as much as I uh, believe in the work that I have, I know that it's, and I think this is true of all works, so it's just a humility thing. I know that it only really works for the students and teachers in schools that I have in mind. Um, so like as a black woman, like I make a lot of decisions about the curriculum that come from like, well, when I was in middle school, this would have been really, really good and like helpful for me. Like talking about Joy Bolomini's work, like, is that a funny story? In hindsight, this is like duh, but like as I was sharing the story with like a bunch of you know black female students, it's like you know, light bulbs going off and just like awe and glory. And then I shared it in a classroom of like mostly white students, and they were just kind of like, uh, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to find another example that resonates better. Yeah. Um, so like yeah, getting it to spread, I think, is a lot about just I don't know, making more opportunities for context. Um, I sort of, before the pandemic, I did a lot of traveling um, to sort of get more of that context. Like um, I went to like Ghana for a couple of weeks. I went to Costa Rica for a couple of weeks. I went to Mexico for a couple of weeks. And like now the school I'm working with uh, is in Dubai and then also have like a couple in the US. And I think what I'm learning from all of those is like the same curriculum doesn't work in all those places. So like, how do you also like allow it to more and change and like to adjust to these new places. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what I kind of think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I love how you started by saying, you know, um, you're still trying to answer that question because it's not it's not an easy question. I knew that was kind of like, <laughs> I don't think it's something you can like fully answer. It's just something we can like attempt to answer and like take steps right. towards too, which is exactly what you're doing in the most beautiful way possible. Um, like. I did not know time could fly so fast. I'm really loving this conversation, but I do have two more questions for you. I had more, but I have shortened, shortened it because this is meant to be about 30 minutes, um, but we're going to go over time, whatever. Um, <laughs> um, so I, my second to the last question um, is for younger students who maybe are in their undergrad in high school, who kind of know that they're interested in education or in CS or who maybe may not be interested in, but will somehow get into the media lab, not wanting to and end up doing what you're doing. Like what advice would you, <laughs> what advice would you give to them? Um, especially if they don't know where to start, but they know that they're passionate or are interested in the slightest way possible in um, AI education access in um, using social robots to teach um, artificial intelligence. What advice would you give? Um, I think, 
you know, there are some people who like plan their whole life and <laughs> it goes exactly according to that. Um, that hasn't super worked out for me. Um, what I think has been helpful is like a always making sure that like wh wherever I currently am, I'm like learning a lot and sort of getting to where I need to be with that. So a great example, I used to hate writing. I like the one awful grade that I have <laughs> in like my entire like transcript of life that will never, I don't know, it, I'll never live it down is like in a writing class. And it was just like, I can't do this. I'm bad at this. Um, but I'm a PhD student and I do a lot of writing. And so I realized that, you know, in order to be successful where I am and like in order to also set myself up well for the next thing, um, you just have to like, you know, embrace your weaknesses, like go after them, like work on it, get better, um, you know, cry, you get a terrible grade, but then like get back up and like, you know, take another English class so you can get a lot better. Um, and I think that's important to say, because like at the end of the day, people are going to sort of like look at your grades, they're going to like look at what you've done. And so that matters. And so, you know, just do your best where you are. But then also when you're trying to decide what to do next, my heuristic is this I don't know what I'm doing next. Like literally, I'm like wrapping up this PhD and people are like, what are you gonna do? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> like, what am I to get here? <laughs> but, um, just like when I was going into the PhD, I like applied to PhD programs, I applied to master's programs, I applied to jobs. And after I, you know, put my best foot forward, got some responses back, some yeses. And then I was like, all right, I'm gonna go and do the coolest thing that's next. And that's it, like that's my whole thing. So in this case, the coolest thing, I met my advisor, Cynthia Brazil, and just like her way of thinking about technology, she's like, technology should be human the same way that we're human. I'm like, that sounds great. And she's like, I built robots. I'm like, I've never built a robot in my life, but you sound <laughs> great. And here we are, like it's, <laughs> yeah, it worked out. Um, so yeah, that, those would be two things that kind of work for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's like, that's very, very cool. I mean um I love your entire experience I love like how you share your experiences and how like authentic you are with like talking about them and it's kind of like you know nobody really I wouldn't say nobody really knows what we're doing but then like people figure things out along the way um and, and I love the idea of picking the next coolest thing in front of you and like just figuring out as you get there um I'm also kind of struggling with the humanities class right now and I don't like writing that much right now but you inspired me right now so I'm gonna keep going <laughs> yes, just keep working at it like you're gonna grow into it yeah, yeah thank you okay and my final question for you um mm. it's maybe a bit of a stopper it's okay if you're not able to think of three words but I want you to come up with three words that describe you and the work that you do so like a word that overlaps or words that overlap with your personality and your work so not just like oh i'm fun if you're fun you have to say your work is fun as well so like just like three words that describe both mm -hmm. overlap with me. yeah yeah i mean my work is fun but i'm gonna <laughs> choose a different word um fun you can use fun <laughs> <laughs> uh i think adventurous uh I just went for a skate because <laughs> I like to learn new things and I'm like this is my new thing and then also with my work I'm like no one's ever tried this let's go for it so adventurous um ooh, like insightful uh you know I like to I like to go deep think about the world and beautiful you know I, I just like I appreciate beauty in the world um yeah <laughs> yeah i think those were fantastic i mean okay so adventurous insightful and beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's i mean like i feel like that does describe your personality and i feel like that also describes the work that you do so you did a great job and in record time <laughs> okay Thank so that you. is all i have for you today but this has been like some of the best 30 something minutes i have ever had i'm not even like trying to hack you up i really enjoyed this conversation a lot more than i expected to um so thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you so much for gracing this interview. Thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of the Harvard, MIT, Women in Artificial Intelligence community. Um, I cannot wait to see what further ground you're breaking, um, not just through the Media Lab, but post Media Lab, post PhD, um, in terms of like interfacing education and artificial intelligence with 
communities that need that access yeah. that need to know about ethics and the hot topic discussions um yeah that is everything you have anything you want to say to everybody watching this <laughs> yeah first i want to say props to you victory for just making this so fun and so painless i was like i don't know what she's gonna ask oh my God, <laughs> but you just you have such a joyful spirit and so i i just it's contagious and i love it oh my gosh, thank um you. everyone else keep watching victory's doing a great job and you know um so excited to hear from this community and to share stuff with y'all so keep it going thank you 